check. We are back. Good morning, Monday morning. The Patriots lost a close one. Um, they uh, they scored 20 points, though. I think they only had one throwing touchdown. They got to throw the ball down the field some more. Um, but you know, other than that, they they didn't turn the ball over. They just they just don't have enough firepower. Uh, down the field, but Jalen Polk got his first touchdown, so get the Patriots stuff out of the way, and they were competitive, like I've said, um, past couple weeks, just want to see competitive ball, so got a short week, Thursday, Jets, I think Tom is going to the game down at MetLife in Jersey, it's coming up just in a couple of days, so uh, four days from now, Jets, Pats, um, one and one versus one and one, we'll see. That was a it was a good Sunday of ball watching football in here. Um, we are going to probably change up the date based on demand for the kids trade night. Um, we've been marketing them, and I changed the date to Sunday. We had a few people come, but I think uh, the groundswell is a little different now, and that's just I think football Sunday schedules people going back to school and there's there's lots to do it's still nice out but overall let's just say none of those things were true and it was you know the weather weather wasn't great and you're trying to think of something to do on a Sunday Um, we still want to make it available but I think right now we're gonna put it on pause until people are really beating down my door to to come in Um, I've got a lot of stuff to do so does the staff here and, um, you know, if, if you want to do a trade night, look, we're, we're in here every day. If you're going to make a trade with us, I got a feeling you're going to ask. So don't be afraid to ask. Um, I think we, what we were doing with the recent trade night was like one trade per kid. So we'd give you a ticket and say, hey, you can, and that's like with the shop. Of course, you can trade amongst yourselves all the time. Um, but one with the shop. So I will be targeting a day, an entire day every month where it will be trade day you can from open to close you can come in and do a trade with the shop or among yourselves in the shop that's totally cool basically it's um the chance to kind of conduct business if you will within the confines here um trade wise so that's coming up thinking about that just you know, when you're starting out, you want to shift things around. You don't want to get too stuck on an idea just because you're trying to be stubborn about it and force it to work. Um, you got to listen to the people. And if the people tell you that it's not quite popping off like you thought, pay attention. Or if it's going better than you thought, double down and do some more of that. Um, so that's just some shop stuff. We've got shows coming up. I'm going to keep talking about it. October 12th, Yarmouth. You want to be there. It's at the AmVets. This is the main card show. Uh, Carter collects cards. We've got Ryan there from Coliseum. We're going to have, pretty sure Don's will be there. Um, my guy Eric is going to be there. Uh, there's a lot of people added to the list. There's, there's a big list of dealers. There's going to be a bigger list of customers. Uh, it's $5 at the door, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m., 4.30 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. is the trade show, uh, the trade night. I'll be at the trade night. Tim's going to be there during the day um, selling stuff, maybe doing deals. Hey, you never know. He might bring some stuff I don't even know about. So you're going to want to be over in Yarmouth on October 12th. It's going to be a lot of fun. That's just the first event we've got kicking off um, our October. And then the next weekend at the Portland Expo, uh, the 19th and the 20th, all day long, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. both days, Saturday and Sunday, the Northeast Sports Card Expo. We will have two tables set up there. Um, Going to be some celebrity guest signing. Uh, Patrick Pass will be there. I've worked with him in the past. So that'll be cool to see him. And I'm sure some other people I don't know about yet. Uh, so that's another chance. We're going to really bring out the big guns for both these shows. So we're going to have some stuff that maybe you haven't seen before or maybe you forgot we had. Um, so... Bring your wallets, bring your really good cards, and let's make some deals. Uh, And with that, let's dive into some of the news items here because I want to kick off first with McCovey Cove Dave. And if you don't know, it's not me, (laughs) who McCovey Cove Dave is. He has been in McCovey Cove out uh, just beyond Wright Field in San Francisco at what was Pac Bell Park. 
um, and is now, I believe, what is the name of the, is it AT&T? I think it's AT&T now. Uh, and he's been in a kayak collecting home run balls or splash hits. And uh, from my research I was reading, he's collected 38 splash hits and 55 balls overall. So splash hits means it's a home run. It goes over the wall and it hits the water. Um, it doesn't bounce in. It, it hits the water immediately. And recently he retrieved the first ever home run splash hit by a right-handed batter in the history of the ballpark. Um which is pretty special. I mean, to hit it that far to right field, that's a that's a bomb. You know, Barry Bonds has hit him in uh, McCovey Cove. I want to say he was the first splash hit. I can't quite remember. Um, and then there's been some grand slams. And recently, uh, McCovey Cove Dave got in, not in trouble, but he was feeling some heat from, I don't know, the the Atlanta Braves press. Because they were asking him, hey, would you give Michael Harris the second he hit a Grand Slam? And it was only the third Grand Slam um, splash hit in the history of McCovey Cove. The other three was Bonds, Michael Tucker, and Mike Yastrzemski. Okay, so this was the third, no, the fourth one. And he w- he didn't want to to give it up because it was the first one he'd ever retrieved. And, again, I know we're talking about a kayaker who collects home run balls. He's no Zach Hample. Uh, that's for another episode. If you know who that is, you're a real baseball fan. Anyway, think what you will about him. He's got his own unique um, angle on the sport um, of collecting balls. And so McCovey Cove Dave, uh, he was – I don't know if he's joking, but he was saying, yeah, like I'd take a job with the Giants or something. I mean, he's been out there a long time. I just think it's interesting that um, the Giant the Giants have not really uh, given him much. I don't know respect. Not that they need to. They don't need to go out of their way to do anything special for this guy. But when something like this happens, if you're in the world of PR, like you got to think, how do you spin this in a positive way for your organization? And that's the thing the Giants have not really done well is they haven't done a good job of. Um, saying, hey, we see you, we recognize you. And that doesn't mean you have to employ the guy, but some more recognition would go a long way for a fan like this. And so if you're, you know, an owner of an organization, you got to understand, like, just recognize your fans. They don't want, they don't need to get paid. They don't want to get paid. Just what are you going to do for them? Like, what's going to motivate him? Who's He's out in a kayak for, I think he said, 700 games he's done over his 20 years being in McCovey Cove collecting these baseballs. What What's his motivation to give up this ball? That's what he does all the time. He's fighting off other kayakers or people in boats, and he's usually right in the right spot because he's done it a bunch of times. But, you know, Giants, like, what's the motivation for him to want to hand over a baseball? I don't really understand. Um, I don't really understand what uh, what's stopping you from just, I don't know, doing a deal with him. Is he being unreasonable? Yeah, po- possibly. I don't know. But he did just pull in uh, the only and first right-handed splash hit in the history of McCovey Cove, and that's pretty cool. Um, he said he wasn't going to give it to the Giants, but he would give it to the to Cooperstown. So, hey, that's legit. Uh, and, you know, Giants, you, you could have made it better by you could have the ball and you could be delivering it to Cooperstown. Hey, maybe, maybe you make an exception and he gets to go with you to give the ball. But by being like, I know that Dave is probably bitter, but being how you guys are being, it's it's not helping the situation. You're not looking for a solution. You don't own the cove. Unfortunately, it's out of your jurisdiction. So maybe if you're a little more cool to McCovey Cove Dave, he might be a little more cool toward you guys. Pretty simple. Kindness goes a long way. And when you're a big organization, you know, sometimes you think you're above everyone else. But, you know, the game is for the fans. The game is for all of us. And um, when the ball goes over your walls, it's not yours anymore. 
So we'll see what happens with that, if there's any big crazy updates. But honestly, it's just kind of a fun baseball thing. I mean, a right-hander hitting a ball out. I've been to that park many times for a game, probably at least over a dozen games when I used to live in the Bay Area. And that's a long way to hit for a lefty. Uh, and the wall is pretty tall, too. And you got to clear the wall, and it's got to go over the walkway where the fans go and make it into the water. So for a righty to hit one out there, that's pretty cool. So that's uh, one baseball thing. And then the other news, bittersweet, Joe Castiglione retiring at the end of the season, the voice of the Red Sox for 42 seasons. He was on the TV broadcast last night for the Yankees game. He said he's probably done 6,500 games and pointed at Euclid and said, I, I've seen every single game you've played. That's or called every game he's played. That's crazy. Uh, it's very comforting it has been listening to Joe Castiglione on the radio broadcast, especially when I lived on the West Coast um, like 10 years ago. And, oh, well, shoot, just a couple years ago in L.A., being able to listen to your team's broadcast, um, it's like it's comforting because when you're not home, it, it makes you feel like you're at home. You can close your eyes, imagine yourself at the ballpark, or imagine yourself at your favorite place listening to local radio. Um, MLB app has definitely allowed fans like us everywhere to listen to whoever we want to listen to. It was like Bob Euchre, who is the um, Harry Doyle in Major League. Ever since I saw Major League, I started listening to more Brewers games so so I could listen to Bob Euchre. And so Castiglione said he'd still be around with the club here and there, being an ambassador, but no more regular Joe on the radio. Uh, he just got the Ford C. Frick Award uh, from the Baseball Hall of Fame, so you know he's in the hall and in that regard and one of the greats times are changing who's gonna be the next man up that's that's kind of my question i don't know i think you know they tried out lou lou's been on the radio broadcast but i like him better doing color commentary versus play-by-play um that's just my personal opinion i like lou on tv and the radio but i i want to have more of a kind of a the straight man if you will like in a lot of comedies you'll have somebody who just plays a straight straight person versus somebody who's doing all the crazy wacky comedy and um so we'll see who they pick as a replacement i'm sure they've been trying people out um i think they have been just on the radio during different broadcasts they have will fleming who i like him a lot so he'd be a good regular play-by-play and then get somebody to do color alongside will maybe that's the move will and lou I like that. But, yeah, Sox Nation. Uh, no more Joe Castig. His voice made it into Dropkick Murphy's song. He made it into Fever Pitch, the film. I mean, they filmed that whole thing during the Red Sox run. So he's cemented in history. One of the, one of the greatest. And, uh, you know, with that, that's, that's kind of our Monday job. What do you think about the... The righty home run at McCovey Cove. Pretty amazing. Pretty, And, you know, of course, the, the, the fun story of it all is uh, McCovey Cove Dave getting the ball and not wanting to give it directly to the Giants. So, <clears throat> hey, that's how it goes, Giants. You could have been a lot cooler to the sky, but I guess you haven't been. I don't have all the facts either. So maybe McCovey Cove Dave said some stuff or wanted too much. That's totally possible. But you still, as a big organization, it's t- tough, but you have to take the high road because in the world of social media, everybody's going to get behind the David and the David versus Goliath. This guy just happens to actually be named Dave, David. Um, court of public opinion, right? It's t- so much tougher as a big company, the Giants, to you know, smooth things over when it doesn't go well. And, and you know, you could have even made a reasonable offer and he didn't accept it, and it's tough, right? Damned if you do, damned if you don't. But I think making a bit more of an effort would, would go a long way with the fans, uh, especially McCovey Cove Dave, who, hey, creates good buzz for your club. You know, can't buy that. That's You, can't, you couldn't pay somebody to go out there in the, in the kayak all, uh, for 700 games. So I don't know. I think it should be a little more cooler toward Dave. But Joe Castig, we appreciate you. 42 seasons being the voice of the Sox. You will be missed. I'll have to tune in to a couple more games here. Just radio. 
Uh, no, no TV. Just to, to hear him a couple couple more times before the season's over because it doesn't look like we're headed to the playoffs. But crazier things have happened. All right, y'all have a good one. See you tomorrow. Peace.